Good morning and welcome to today's um, event at the Directive, EU Energy Transition, What Role for Critical Raw Materials? I'm supported by the Nickel Institute, where we will delve into the importance and the challenges ahead when it comes to critical raw materials, as well as the upcoming Critical Raw Materials Act. I'm Oliver Neuern, Senior Editor at um, EU Active Germany, and I will moderate today's event. Um, we have a couple of really good um, speakers today. So, first of all, we have Titas um, Anushkevichkus, who is a policy officer um, for energy intensive in industries at DG Growth at the European Commission. We have Hildegard Bentele, a member of the EGP Committee um, in the European Parliament and rapporteur for a European strategy for critical raw materials, which is often also dubbed, dubbed the Bentele Report um, after her. Then we have Evdokia Moise, Senior Trade Policy Analyst at the OECD, and Julia Poliskanova, Senior Director for Vehicles and E-Mobility at Transport and Environment. Then we have Giorgio Corbetta, EU Affairs Director at Eurobat, and last but not least, Dr. Mark Mistry, Senior Public Policy Manager at the Nickel Institute. Um, so, Let's try to kick off this, this event with a short um, statement of each of our speakers. So maybe, Titus, could you like um, have a, a short statement, 60 seconds, um, where you kind of um, um, show us your main, your main um, key points when it comes to critical raw materials and the questions of these events? Well, good morning, everyone. Basically, the, the key point is to summarize it of the green economy we're moving to is very uh, raw material intensive. Uh, we were moving away from fossil fuels into, uh, raw, mat into raw material intensive world where we'll need, uh, in, 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 we'll need many more uh, wind turbines, many more solar panels, many more uh, electric vehicles, which all of them require all kind of raw materials to produce, and they usually uh, require more raw materials than what we had in the past. Uh, so in this world, uh, is in this future, uh, for a cars differ, you know, how much more nickel we'll need, how much more aluminum we'll need, uh, but in all scenarios that we see, uh, we'll need more of these materials uh, to the point where it becomes a, a real concern how we're going to supply it, uh, how even though the discussions in, 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 in among the spe specialists and uh, among people who are dealing with raw materials for, for many years for a cost that we might have shortages on this on that and so on, but we so far we always managed to find either new technology or replace the material with something else which could do the same thing or even better. But going forward, uh, this is a really, really major issue uh, which needs to be addressed. Otherwise, we're building uh, this uh, green and uh, world on, on very shaky ground. So raw materials really have to be addressed going forward. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot, Titas. Maybe um, next, um, Hildegard, for, um, the stage is yours, a 60 second statement. Yeah, good morning to all of you. Uh, and uh, what I would like to say at the beginning, uh, my goal, which I would like to achieve uh, in the coming weeks and months with regard to the legislative work, which is ahead of us for me as a parliamentarian, uh, is to trigger action, because I think we need action uh, with regard um, to manufacturers, that they check their supply chains and uh, diversify them. Uh, we need action with, uh, uh, with regard to projects that mining and recycling and processing companies start projects because we need them, as it was mentioned uh, 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 by my colleague before, that because we have a much higher demand and we also want that projects start in Europe. And the third thing is uh, we also need to trigger action with politicians because we need to have a coherent legislative framework on all levels, not only on the European, but mainly on the national level, on the regional level, on the local level. Um, and we need to push also for our strategic goals. We need to make sure that we need diversified and better access to uh, raw materials on all levels. And we have to have a coherent legislative framework. But we also need faster permitting and we need uh, uh, well-staffed administrations uh, because all this was neglected a little bit in the past when we did not have a lot of mining in Europe. Thanks a lot. So next in line is Evdokia. Your statement, please. Thank you. 
Um, what I would like to stress is that you know, in, in, in agreement with previous speakers, uh, critical raw materials will be uh, essential for in the coming years for the green transition. And uh, OECD analysis shows that uh, their availability and uh, resulting dependencies and vulnerabilities uh, are uh, related to a number of factors uh, going from natural endowments to policies to uh, uh, the, the, the participation and action of the private sector. Uh, with respect to natural endowments, Europe is probably not in the best uh, positions. There are a few of EU members that are uh, significant producers of the 10 most uh, critical raw materials. And obviously, uh, policies uh, can go a certain uh, way to uh, address those dependencies and those uh, vulnerabilities uh, that Europe has. But uh, it is important to look at the problem in a more holistic way and in parallel with uh, any policies and any actions to ensure uh, the availability of, of critical raw materials. Uh, significant thought has to be uh, given to uh, innovation towards alternative solutions of uh, supporting the green transition with uh, less dependency to some of those uh, materials and uh, also in um, pushing uh, more strongly for uh, addressing part of the problem through more coherent and efficient circular economy solutions. Thanks a lot, Evdokia. So, Julia, and you are next in line, so the floor is yours. Your priorities, please. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Aleva, and thanks for having TNE as well at this event. Uh, really great timing as we all await, of course, the Commission's proposals on, on this. I'd like to say that I think nowhere is the race for green or clean tech more obvious than in the race for critical metals globally. China has the dominance, now the United States with the IRA is really catching up fast. And it's quite easy looking at all of this to dismiss Europe's efforts before we even began. However, I very much agree there with what Ms. Bentele said. I think this shows that we need to act really quickly and really ambitiously, and we still can, can do it. What should Europe do? First of all, let's not forget our strengths. We have one of the best, strongest markets with consumer power in the world. That means that when we have strong regulations, there is investment certainty to bring this business to Europe. For example, getting electric vehicles in Europe resulted in many battery factories that today are driving business case further upstream into processing, into refining, etc. Now, we do need something specific for critical raw materials, and that's where Critical Raw Materials Act comes in, and it's really important, and it really can't come fast enough. We need to look there at self-sufficiency, and I really look forward to discussing this here today. How do we secure these metals, looking at extraction, refining, processing? But we should also not forget that our waste is often our asset. And more than other continents in Europe, we actually will have a lot coming from recycling streams. So how do we really make it happen and make it not go first to places like South Korea or China? Thank you. Thanks, Julia. So, Georgia. Um, what are the main priorities from the industry side? Thank you very much, Oliver, and thank you for having us. So, as mentioned, I work with Eurobat, which is the trade association representing battery manufacturers and, in general, battery value chain players with operations in the European Union and beyond across all battery technologies. The perspective that we obviously uh, have is uh, one of one of the sector, if not the sector, that uh, drives most of the demand for raw materials. And this is obviously um, something uh, that is important also to the European Union because of the role that batteries play in achieving the Green Deal objectives. Uh, this is true if you think of um, how relevant batteries are for cutting emissions across power generation, mobility, logistics, and beyond. And so 
Raw materials are obviously fundamental uh, to continue building batteries that are deployed in the European Union. But as mentioned, and probably most importantly for this conversation we're having now, batteries are a key driver for raw materials demand moving forward. If you think about it, um, it, electric cars are probably the main source of energy transition metals demand. That's about 50 to 60 percent of the overall demand. So that's actually quite a lot, right? And so this has obviously a number of strategic implications for the European Union, which I, I assume we're going to discuss later in this in this uh, conversation, though operationally and short term, the question now is what can the European Union do to sustain such uh, growth and instead of supply of actually raw materials. And uh, this is obviously to be put in the broader context. And I'm not going to be the first one to actually mention that of, you know, big and bold industrial plans across other jurisdictions. And so the Critical Raw Materials Act is definitely part of the answer. And we appreciate the effort that the European Commission is putting into that. And for batteries, you know, that means really ensuring consistency with other pieces of legislation. And um, I know that might sound demodé and probably a, a given to most, though we really fear the possibility that the act will introduce additional layers of provisions around things such as due diligence, recycling efficiencies, recovery rates, which are already addressed in other pieces of legislation, including in particular the batteries regulation. So I'll leave it at that and I'm looking forward to discussing these critical topics with the panel and with the audience too. Thank you. Thanks, Giorgio. So next is you, Mark. So last but not least, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm, I'm very pleased to what I have heard so far from the other speakers, as this is very much in line with, with our thinking. I think it's timely to have right now a critical raw materials act uh, being underway. Uh, we know there's a need to actually support domestic supply of raw materials, to actually foster recycling to work on raw materials diplomacy, which is critical as for some raw materials, we still depend on supply from resource region, regions outside the European Union. There's one point that I would like to highlight, which was mentioned by three of uh, the speakers before, which is coherence of the regulatory framework and planning security. It is important to understand, and this is not something specific to nickel, but to the entire metals and raw materials industry to understand that we are an industry which is very cost intensive. Uh, when we talk about opening a mine, we are talking about a multi-billion euro investment. And you need to have the planning security to ensure that this is going to pay off over the coming 20, 25 years. And that requires um, planning security, a regulatory framework, which is coherent, and we feel that in the Raw Materials Act, there should be also space to address this point. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mark. So before we kick off the debate, um, so you can follow this debate on Twitter and debate it under the hashtag EADebate. And for those of you who are subscribed, you can, can also chat on Slido and ask questions. And if they are relevant, um, I will try to pick them up. Um, and ask to our panelists. Um, and we've actually already a few of them, but um, before we um, start with, with the questions, um, just um, to our panelists, please keep your answers short and concise. There are like we, a, a lot of different questions, a lot of different topics we have to answer today. So um, don't be, be um, don't feel bad if I'm maybe shutting you down if you're talking too much. This has been just um, to, to keep the, the discussion as lively as possible. So maybe um, to start with a more general question, and it's like um, maybe one for you, Hildegard, which is like, why is a critical raw material why are critical raw materials so essential for the success of success of the green transition? Well, they they are essential because we have uh, set ourselves very ambitious targets, 
they have a very clear uh, time frame because we want to be uh, climate neutral until 2050. We want to reduce uh, emissions uh, about 55% until 2030. So we have very clear targets. And to achieve these targets, uh, we need a certain amount of, uh, as it was said, renewable energy, which results in more windmills, more efficient motors for windmills, uh, which results in, in more e-vehicles, also ideally in more digitalization, so for which we need also more uh, raw materials. And what we have seen now, uh, we even might need more raw materials for defense purposes, because we are challenged by war and uh, we have seen all the deficits with regard to our European uh, uh, defense industry, to our, to our armaments, and also there we need raw materials. We should not neglect uh, this uh, aspect which might come up, which we have not yet calculated into our demand, but which is also something we should uh, deal with. So uh, we have very clear targets. We want to achieve them with new technologies and for these technologies we need uh, critical raw materials uh, uh, and as it was said by the colleague from Eurobat mainly results in batteries which we also need not only for e-vehicles but also for storage um, which is also very important if you want to back up um, all the renewable uh, energy which we will have in our uh, transmission networks uh, in the future. <clears throat> so the World Bank estimates that um the demand of critical raw materials will surge by, um, by up to 500% until 2050. So maybe mm -hmm. a question for you, Abdokia, what are, the main, what are the main green sectors that are driving um, this demand, demand surge in this really short amount of time frame? Is it like mainly batteries, is it also solar? Um, so, so what is driving this extraordinary um, growth of demand? Well, um Indeed, uh, one of the most important ones is batteries. Uh, we see that uh, in that sector, uh, many, many uh, critical materials are uh, involved. Uh, fuel cells uh, are in the same situation. Uh, wind and solar are important too. Simply uh, the variety of materials that are, is, uh, is involved at this stage is, is uh, less important. Uh, one point I would like to stress on that one is that while we often talk about uh, uh, cobalt, lithium, nickel, uh, the so to speak traditional uh, industrial materials like steel and aluminum, are pretty much at the center of the problem uh, too and and they may be they may not be uh, rare as, as some other materials are but uh, the same uh, geopolitical uh, and economical uh, instability factors uh, may play uh, there and would need to be addressed thanks it's okay so We've already talked a little bit about, about the Critical Raw Materials Act. I mean, it has been announced during the State of the Union speech of Ursula von der Leyen, but has recently gained um, even more track with the EU's response to the US Inflation Reduction Act. Where you've seen in the Green Deal industrial plan, it's really taking like a, a major role. So maybe a question for you, Julia, because I've seen that um, transport and the environment um, recently had like a short research paper about um, Re reaching certain targets when it comes to refinement of lithium um, and 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 um, and the extraction of other um, critical raw materials. So, do you think that that um, th this is currently enough to really bring bring your back on track when it comes to the extraction of critical raw materials? What we've seen so far in recent weeks and months. Yes, uh, thanks for this question. Um, actually, excellent timing to to also talk about uh, talk about that. Maybe I'd like to, to take very quickly a step back and say a few words generally about the US IRA. I think US IRA is really a game changer. I think it shows you can change supply chains with a strong policy. And if we are to be successful in our response, we need to really mirror what it does. US IRA is focused. Almost half of all the money is actually planned for batteries, 150 billion, according to Credit Suisse analysis. It's really simple. So it's very simple tax credits. A company knows they have visibility up until 2032. The credits are also bankable. So this bankability, this long term is very important for business. Now, if we'll 
look at this and we compare this with the Green Deal industrial plan that's recently out, does it do that? The answer is no. Unfortunately not. It's not focused. We talk about everything. We even talk about biofuels and, and carbon capture and storage. We simply don't have money or time not to be focused. Also, is it simple? Not at all. It just repackages a lot of stuff. It doesn't actually have a new, fresh, proper finance pillar to back the European Green Deal. We need to have a strong European sovereignty fund that directly grants companies, that really gets this support for production scale, not just investment aid, right? And, and that's really what's missing. Beyond that, uh, the proposals around state aid are good, but ultimately only one or two countries in Europe will really benefit. So that's not a European solution. So that's around IRA. Now on critical raw materials, it's really hard to judge because of course we're still all awaiting the proposals from the European Commission. We hope that the critical raw materials act is equally simple, has simple targets, addresses permitting, has strategic projects and high standards underpinning this whole agenda. And, and if it can do that in a simple and lean way, then we still have a chance. Um, thanks, thanks a lot, Julia. So maybe, so what you've already said is like that it's, that's the green, deal, um, the, the green Deal industrial plan doesn't really look focused enough. And that maybe is a question for, for TITAS. So we have seen that there are a lot of different legislations recently dealing with somewhat similar issues. We have like the, um, the upcoming um, Critical Raw Materials Act. Now we also have an announced Net, net Zero Act. Then we have like due diligence regulation, um, who's also like feeding into, into the same kind of problem and the battery regulation. Is this like not focused enough? Is it like too broad? Are there too many legislations? Or um, is it really important to, to distinguish between all of those different things? Or wouldn't it just be better to have like a comprehensive legislative framework for, um, for these issues? Titas. Well, if, if we look at it, all of them cover a bit different bits of, of a puzzle. So at, at the same time, you cannot, we, you know, of course, the aim is not to duplicate uh, legislation and uh, cover same same issues and same problems uh, multiple times over and over. Uh, so from that perspective, uh, Critical Raw Materials Act, you know, will will be something uh, dedicated fr framework for for critical raw materials, uh, because if you look at it, what will what will we'll take, so let's say, what uh, a net zero act, uh, it it will come later in the value chain uh, at manufacturing stage for green technologies. Uh, if we look at battery regulation, it's it, it's product specific uh, and due diligence one is, is 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 very much horizontal so it's 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 not really we're covering same bits uh, I hear your your suggestion of, of, of trying to do it uh, everything in on one go on everything uh, but uh, the reality is that you know we, we, these these uh, work streams just happen to come uh, at, at, at the same time but it's it's not one uh, one legislation that would cover all, each of them has has different target uh, and is part of a, of a puzzle. And obviously that's part of our work is to make sure that they don't overlap and uh, don't contradict each other. Thanks a lot. So I'm already having a lot of questions in, in um, Slido. And one of the questions actually kind of fitting in into this more introductory um, round is, um, the question of dependency and European sovereignty. So we have a couple of them. Um, but that's maybe maybe one for you, for you, Hildegard, again, where it's like we are currently really dependent on China when it comes to, to uh, um, over half of these critical raw materials that are currently defined as critical. So first of all, uh, how, how, do we get, how did we get here? And maybe secondly, is there like a kind of a shift taking place um, in how we are addressing those kind of problems the risk, when it comes to risk assessment, but, but also when it comes to um, the problem of dependencies. Well, exactly. I mean, this is what we are pressuring for. And this is also, I think, the field where the Commission is most active. We are searching for new partners. This is the part of diversification. And I think we need to make companies understand, manufacturers to understand that they have to check their supply chains because it's the most the easiest thing to, if you only check for the price and if you uh, don't look for the risk which might go with your with your supply chain so i think this is what we have to force or i mean force uh, we have to 
we have to try uh, to, to bring into the minds of uh, not only those who, who, who buy critical raw materials and, 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 and but also into the board. It needs to be considered as a strategic question because this is what we have learned from the pandemic and this is what the war is, is, is teaching us that we have to be more careful, that we have to look more ahead, not only to the next year or to, to the next two years, we have to be aware that China might attack Taiwan and we have to prepare for this moment and we have to uh, prepare for the moment that there might be sanctions or there might be export bans, which we have already experienced. Or if there is the situation that China just has a higher demand because it is again, you know, jumping up production after the um, after the pandemic now. So I, I think this is this is what we have to achieve first that we um, make uh, uh, companies look for better supply chains. And what we can do from the political side, what the Commission is doing, having this framework of partnership agreements, uh, making this umbrella with new partners like, I don't know, Greenland, Australia, Canada, and so on with reliable partners where we can also put in also all, all our soft power that we have because we can combine it with the trade, uh, uh, trade uh, preferences, we can combine it with development aid, with, uh, uh, with uh, legal migration, whatever. I mean, there are many incentives we can we can do. And I think this is the, the first task to, to get less dependent because we all know that projects in Europe will take time, as it was said, unfortunately, much too long. It will take years. And also recycling will only kick in, in let's say, you know, ideally 10 years or so that we get the relevant amounts. So for the time being, it's all into diversification. We need to bring this into the heads of, 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 of our um, chief executive officers. And we have to accompany this with, uh, with action from the, from the European side. But the diplomacy, which was actually mentioned. Okay, we're already having like a couple of interventions from, from other panelists here. So, um, First, I want to give the floor to Julia again, who wanted to, to answer um, as well. Thanks. Thank you, Oliver. Um, so just to say, I think first, we need to be honest about indeed how we got here. And how we got here is that we wasted a bit of our time focusing on things such as diesel, uh, for example, while China were investing in this battery value chain for decades. So that's also quite important. Now, how do we get out of this dependency on China? Well, actually, we can do... Uh, what China does, but better with our standards. China does not mine all of their metals. They actually often, um, materials are mined abroad and they are brought to China to do the processing, where the value is, that value chain around refining and processing. And that's what Europe should also focus on. We are not a mining superpower. We can't do all that extraction. But there, I very much agree with uh, with Ms. Bantela on uh, partnerships with resource rich countries and trade. And then let's set clear, strong targets around refining and processing in Europe. Let's prioritize them in finance, et cetera, as strategic projects to also do that in Europe. And one last addition on, on recycling. Actually, when we look at that today, when we have analysis um, done on how much we can get from recycling, we can get up to 10 12% of cobalt, nickel, and lithium from recycling streams uh, by 2030 already. Why? Not because end-of-life uh, cars are coming to the end of life that early, but because we have all these battery factories that, especially in the first years, will have a lot of manufacturing scrap that we can recycle. Today, we send it to China and South Korea. But instead, if we have that industry in Europe, this is 10, 12% of metals that our companies don't have to buy on spot markets on high prices. So that's an important part of resilience as well. Okay, maybe one, for, um, one question for you, um, Giorgio. Like, from, from, an in, from an industry side, is there like a change uh, when it comes to risk assessments, when it comes to China? Do we, um, do we look differently now at supply chains? And, and um, yeah, what, what, is, what, is, what is your point on, on this issue? Sure, so a lot has been said, and I can't obviously comment on everything though i think with china there's obviously quite a lot of, to catch up i think they've been moving uh into the field at least 20 years back so i don't think it's actually possible to 
become independent, though I would actually question whether the real objective of the European Union, at least from an industrial perspective, is to become independent, fully independent from any other jurisdiction of the world. And I think this is important to mention and to fully appreciate because batteries is a global value chain and that's not going to change the way it works at the macro and the micro level is that you do have larger companies mostly upstream so in the mining space but then the lower you get into the value chain you have smaller player and for the european union there's a lot of small and medium enterprises which constitute also the backbone of the battery value chain domestically into into the european union so i think what is possible and what the european union should actually be doing is to move towards a more multipolar battery value chain in particular upstream where metals get actually processed elsewhere too not just in china as julie was mentioning but this is really about the business case and so far we don't have immediately clear intelligence that there is actually a business case in investing in battery processing and recycling within the European Union. And this goes back to what's the role of the European Union, what's the role of national governments, you know, what the support should look like. I think it's difficult to compare, and that's the last thing I'm going to mention. I think it's very difficult to compare the context and the background the IRA comes from with the European Union one, because it's a completely different political system. There's 27 of us here in the European Union. And as we all know, getting to any decision is very difficult and takes a long time. However, I would agree with Julian and with the others. I think what's important is that, um, and probably that's why the IRA has been actually positive because it's really pushed the European Union to consolidate thoughts that were being floated for a very long time. And so the EU action shouldn't only be reactive, but what's important is that it factors in the high EU environmental standards and really leverages them domestically and internationally. There's a lot more a lot to say, but I'll pause here. Maybe, um, Tita, something for you. So Georgia, Georgia just said that we shouldn't become, we're not even able to become fully autonomous. But is that even something that the Commission wants? I mean, as far as I can tell, it's like a mix between more autonomy, more diversification. So what is the main goal um, for, um, um, regarding the Fertile Raw Materials Act for the Commission? Uh, we'll see what, what, what will, will be the end result and what will come out. In critical will be in the critical raw materials act i think it's a bit too early to say uh, where where that will land but overall basically looking at uh, at, at our policy and uh, you know and things we mentioned so far obviously we need to do more the, the company level would would be great if we would do more in terms of uh, securing supply going forward uh, and obviously, it makes sense that we do more within EU. We do more in terms of recycling. All, 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 all that will be a solution. There is no one uh, golden bullet that sort of solves everything, or one solution that solves everything. So everyone will have to to to, to do some efforts. Uh, it's. Pr I agree with Georgia. It probably doesn't make sense to 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 be fully uh, self-sufficient on, on everything. So, in some cases, we don't have these raw materials at all within EU, and we need to bring things uh, from from abroad. Uh, but obviously, the the problem is not is it. Uh, 
produced in EU or outside, the, the main issue, so of course, it's a dependency and the risk that come with that. So we need to solve that problem rather to think in the, yes, so yes, we need to produce everything ourselves within EU or not. So the, I think that that risk assessment on each material might be different and we might need to be do a bit different results. But obviously we would need to try to do more within EU ourselves uh, to, to reduce these dependencies and to reduce the risks of, of, of supply shortages going forward. Mark, maybe a question for you, like a follow-up question on, on what Titus just said. So, I mean, what, from an industry perspective, what would actually be required to, to kind of um, um, have a larger critical raw materials industry in, in Europe? And maybe what are your expectations um, for the Critical Raw Materials Act? So I think that uh, Tita has already pointed out one very critical point. We cannot change the geology in Europe. So there might be some raw materials where there is potential uh, to actually um, ensure that we have in future a stronger domestic supply with primary raw materials. And we also know that um, there's more potential to recycle more raw materials once uh, products reach the end of life. But I think, and uh, Julia put it very nicely together, it's a combination of different efforts which is required. We need on the one side, and that would be more a long-term measure to ensure that we harvest the potential that we have at Europe scale, at European scale, in, um, you know, supporting domestic supply with primary raw materials. But these trade partnerships are going to play a critical role. And I think that um, Australia was mentioned, Canada was mentioned, Brazil was not mentioned, but there are a wide range of countries um, outside of Europe that um, offer their service as becoming a partner to the European Union and to supply them with raw materials. And this is where I think that the work done by the European Commission in actually assessing raw materials from a criticality perspective can actually um, serve as a basis as this is information that the European Commission gathered on more than 80 raw materials. Um, and that can serve as a wonderful basis to understand where do we have potential? Um, what are the potential trade partners right now, but also in the future that we have to liaise with in order to ensure that we have a safe and continuous supply over the coming decades. We've already seen like a re in recent years a lot of shortages when it comes to critical raw, to raw materials. Magnite, for instance, um, in 2020, which was like a big deal. So maybe one question for you, Avdokia, how do we um, avoid such shortages in the future? What, what is like the, 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 the way ahead that you would say is the most um, which is the, what's the most important things that we have to implement to avoid those shortages? Um, a word, a term that, that was just used by Mark, combination, I think it's, uh, it's important. Um, um, I would like to stress, uh, to, to start with, that uh, when we're, we're looking at uh, dependencies and at the countries, that uh, are, let's say, behind uh, those dependencies, half of them, uh, half of critical raw materials dependencies are uh, to uh, China, Russia, Brazil, South Africa, and India. And among those countries are uh, three countries that are among the top five in terms of the number of new export restrictions that were put in place between the period of 2009 and 2020. And these are China, India, and Russia. So uh, I think that uh, policies uh, from our countries in the European Union and more generally uh, at, at the OECD level need to be uh, at the same time defensive and I wouldn't use the word aggressive, but proactive. And what I mean by that is uh, tackling, uh, on the one hand, uh, those uh, export uh, restrictions through policy negotiations, 
partnerships and keeping in mind that uh, the European Union has its own uh, very important economic power, that for some of those materials, uh, we have a very high concentration of, of uh, processing in the European Union. Germany is, is among uh, the countries that, that does that quite a lot. Um, uh, but also that for some of the, of the materials, it is very frequently a buyer's market and that uh, we, can, we can count on that. Secondly, we can push for uh, partnerships, as Mark, as Mark was, uh, was, was saying, with like-minded uh, countries, in particular as some of the restrictions I was referring to are linked to uh, the role of, of uh, state-owned uh, enterprises, of uh, um, um, outright uh, prohibitions of, of exports, not just uh, uh, policies that would affect the price of, uh, of, of the product. And on those ones, uh, uh, there is quite an, a significant role for policies to be, uh, to be proactive and, and, and to address those. Then, uh, obviously, uh, in parallel to that, continue encouraging um, private sector initiatives towards uh, alternative solutions for some of those materials. Thanks. So, Titus, maybe maybe a question for you. So, um, Breton already said that in the critical raw materials act, they are kind of aiming for for a certain percentage of um, critical raw materials being extracted in Europe. Um, um, like. How, how is the commission, commission actually planning on doing that? You don't have to be into, in de into too much detail about the percentages or anything like that, but more like um, what does extraction actually um, contain? Is it like m primarily mining? Is it um, recycling? Other, maybe other sources of extraction that we're having. So your thoughts on that, Titas? Uh, I'll better repeat myself. It's a bit too early to say what will be in Critical Raw Materials Act itself. Uh, I think that's under consultation still. Uh, so we'll see what, what, what will be there. Uh, at, at, at the same time, uh, I think we, Commissioner, have already and mentioned what we, what we spoke about 10, 15, 20, 30 percent, something like that, this kind of numbers uh, uh, where. But again, we're coming back to what uh, Mark just mentioned. You know, geology defines how much of that we have inside. Uh, the existing uh, material in 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 use also defines what we can do with, through recycling already now. So it's it's basically story for each for each material is 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 different and it doesn't make sense to say we will we'll go for the same percentage across the board or something of a sort uh, so that is obviously doesn't make sense uh, i think each each raw material uh, has different story to tell now and let's say as already was alluded a bit earlier after we build up the stocks in eu you know of through recycling, we might cover much more and produce much more in 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 Europe and recycling to become key source of of, of these materials going forward. But at this stage, while we we need to build up, it's 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 it's, it's not the case for recycling to cover all our needs. Uh, I, I but. If we look at you know how do we do more ourselves within the EU, uh, so obviously. As I mentioned, story probably different in each case, but at the same time, looking where we struggle the most uh, is mining is, is diversified globally, and it, it also it depends on geology. It doesn't depend on, on, on where the borders are or, or anything of a sort. So geology defines where we get uh, the metals or, or, or raw materials from. Uh, the part where major major change happened over the last couple of decades is is, is China moving really into processing. Uh, so s s here we're talking about smelting and and, and refining. 
Uh, these are most energy intensive processes uh, in, in most of cases. So here is basically where probably we need the most effort uh, in order to create a business case for, for, for European companies to have to do it here internally. So I think that, that, that's the key point to, to mention going forward. Okay, Julia, um, maybe a question for you, Julia. So, of course, like extraction, we always think about mining, but there's also recycling, which is quite important. Actually, I have also a few questions in the chats already about recycling. So, what do you think, what kind of role can recycling play and so um, strive for, for more autonomy? And so what are the main challenges ahead when it comes to recycling? Yes, thank you. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk a bit about recycling, but maybe more broadly on, on critical raw materials act, just to stress that we as, as transport and environment do really support Europe setting a goal around self-sufficiency. But what is important is when we talk about critical metal self-sufficiency, we have a broader term for that, that includes extraction as well as refining and secondary sources. And only if we take all that together, if we, for example, is in terms of resources, take primary and secondary, can Europe meet goals such as 30%. Our analysis actually shows that just looking at European projects uh, and what's coming up in terms of raw materials, we can get at most 10% of things like nickel and even a bit less cobalt from European projects, but we're doing a bit better on lithium. So if this really kicks off, we can actually be almost half sufficient in lithium by 2030, thanks also to newer technologies such as geothermal direct lithium extraction, for example. So there is some potential, but the most biggest potential that we see in terms of self-sufficiency, just to stress once again, is in refining. And we really would like to see a target around refining at least half of metals, critical metals, to be refined in Europe by 2030. This also helps recycling because it's very similar industrial processes that you need. Now, a, a few, a quick word on still on recycling, if, if I may still add, if you give me one, one more minute, Oliver. Um, on recycling, here we just need to really leverage and accelerate that field. One thing that we're really missing today is a new technology, low hanging fruit around so called remining, where we mine metals from waste. If we just require to map and evaluate the potential across Europe, a lot of business will actually go uh, will 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 go there, and just because Tita's actually mentioned the the high intensity of smelting, I'd like to stress that also requiring measuring and reporting CO two emissions from uh, various uh, sources, uh, refining critical metals in Europe is also helping European industry because it will put smelting, for example, in Europe more advantageously than smelting somewhere else where the carbon footprint would be higher. Thank you. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot, Julia. Um, so maybe to, to get into a little bit of, of, um, of a different topic, more basic actually for the critical raw materials section, more, most basic question is probably which, um, critical raw, uh, which raw materials would actually be defined as critical. And um, here I've, I've often read like the distinction between the critical and strategic raw materials. Like, do we need those def definitions? And do they add like, do they have like added value? What is the actual difference between the two? Maybe and um, Tito's, you could Tito's, you could explain a little bit um, to what, what that entails. Okay, uh, so when we talk about critical raw materials, European Commission screens. Uh, quite uh, and and the list is all going up in terms of uh, materials are important for 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 our economy uh, at the moment now in, in the latest exercise we are screening basically 88 materials uh, and the first result of this kind of screening and, and defining what is critical uh, raw materials were came out in 2011 and every three years that list is is, is being updated the list is primarily based uh, on, on historical trade data, existing technologies, existing patents, uh, and, and so on, so on, ability to, 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 to change, uh, to replace this material with something else, and so on. Uh, so, but it's, it's mostly uh, historically looking, uh, and, and, and that is the process which is uh, 
very well run, very well recognized, very useful, uh, but technology, uh, but the methodology is, is more or less set in uh, already and consistency, keeping consistency is, is, is really important because otherwise it basically it's, it becomes moving target. So that is, is in place. And as I mentioned, the, the key point, it is primarily based on, on uh, uh, what, what already happened and where we are right now. Uh, at the same time, if each of these critical raw materials lists, commission publishes a foresight uh, report, a foresight study, that, which basically looks in, into key technologies of the future and what will be the needs. Um, so when we talk about strategic uh, raw materials, here I think the, the key point to think is, is, is about the future. So what will be uh, the needs in the future? Uh, and, and that's basically the different perspective of bringing the forward-looking point of view, uh, which is obviously knowing and this the speed of a transition that we need and, and the major demand that is already mentioned by everyone, World Bank, OECD, and so on, so on, so on, so on, uh, of the major needs for, for uh, raw materials and the changes in the needs. Uh, I think that point in terms of when talk about strategic value is, is will have this uh, future-looking uh, perspective. Okay, thanks a lot. So we will actually circle back a little bit to recycling again because there are a few interventions by other panelists and, um, you know, I, I think that's a really imp an important point. So, Mark, you said you um, you wanted to comment on recycling as well, with the challenges ahead. So, um, the floor is yours. Yeah, it's, it's uh, I, I would like to comment on what Julia said regarding carbon footprint and smelting. I'm, I'm quite surprised to see that it took us 50 minutes to start talking about carbon footprint and sustainability as I think this is also a key element in the what we expect to be in the critical raw materials act and I agree with Julia that um, all, all metals are actually energy intensive and linked to a certain carbon footprint and especially European producers are working hard on reducing on the one side the energy demand but on the other side also the carbon footprint so there are opportunities linked to this whole topic. If we marry these uh, both issues, on the one side, uh, raw materials demand, and on the other side, the whole aspect of, um, of or the whole dimension of sustainability. Um, there's one point I would like to mention, which is um, the worst case would be that in the Raw Materials Act, we are defining a new layer of sustainability requirements which is not in line, which is um, with what is already out there. So our producers, for example, are actually dealing with, um, on the one side, ESG requirements, due diligence in the context of the battery regulation. They are also looking since 20 years into their carbon footprint and providing data. And what we would like to see is that there is coherence and consistency in the requirements which are set. And as I said, the worst case would be to have additional requirements which look differently, as we know that there were, for example, discussions taking place on defining European standards. And that is actually definitely something that we should avoid. Thanks a lot, Mark. Um, Evdokia, you also wanted to comment on the carbon footprint. So um, maybe you can add a little bit to what Mark and Julia already on said. Recycling. Uh, challenges rather than the carbon mm. footprint per se. Um, uh, there are there are a series of policies that make the whole circular chain more complicated. In particular, for sophisticated products like uh, lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. Uh, first of all, uh, we still do not have a very clear definition of whether those and at what stage they are waste or not. And as long as we don't have that at the international level, I'm not talking about the European level, uh, it is, uh, uh, we, we, we are under um, bans uh, that are applicable in the context of the Basel Convention. And uh, it makes it very, very difficult to bring back um, those batteries that have been sold as part of vehicles uh, in particular outside, outside uh, Europe. A second uh, policy issue is uh, the standards and technical regulations that apply 
to those uh, to those products and that are still uh, sufficiently let's say diverge so as to make uh, technical solutions for um, a recycling that achieves uh, economies of scale uh, quite complicated and a third part is uh, the uh, the policies concerning extended producer responsibility we're still not uh, in a position to to ensure a, a full follow-up uh, with extended producer producer responsibility when those products leave uh, the the the, uh, the domestic uh, ground or go outside the European Union and it is something that that needs to be addressed both by policy makers and in in cooperation with with the private sector um, uh, on the basis of uh, stewardship and, and take back schemes. Thanks a lot, Evdokia. So maybe going back to, to the question of critical raw materials and which critical raw materials are deemed critically. I mean, um, Tita's already said, outlined, that we have to look into the future to determine them. But especially since um, there are a lot of technological um, 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 changes and the, the whole field is developing so quickly, uh, maybe a question for you, um, Hildegard. How are we best doing that? How are we outlining? Um, um, how are we looking into the future to define um, which critical raw materials are actually the most critical ones? And also, like regarding that, a lot of other um, countries like Canada, US, or China, or Australia have completely different raw materials that they define as critical. Maybe is there like a lack of coherence, or how, how, how is that um, actually working and happening? Yeah, I'm aware of this discussion about critical raw materials, strategic raw materials. <laughs> and so uh, I think there's some, uh, what uh, teachers said, there's some, uh, there's a good aspect. Um, so it seems like um, Ms. Bentele had, um, that she has like a little a bit of problems to connect. Maybe the same questions for Avdokia though, I mean. Um, especially when it comes to the different raw materials who are which are defining critical in um, different OECD countries like Canada or Australia. So what are your thoughts on that maybe? Well, um, in, in the OECD uh, inventory of uh, export restrictions on critical raw materials, we have a tendency to use uh, a combined, so a much larger uh, definition of, of, of critical raw materials and we incorporate uh, let's say everything that is considered critical uh, both uh, in in the context of the european union and the united states uh, australia uh, um, canada uh, i would say that uh, uh, this uh, as uh, titas was uh, has put it um, is based uh, on historical, uh, uh, let's say, data uh, with respect to, to, to trade flows, uh, production, and, and known uh, reserves. And um, you know, it, it, it can vary. I don't see uh, uh, the, the divergences between the definitions uh, among various countries as problematic uh, per se. They, they may uh, relate to each country's uh, specific circumstances. It's okay, Hildegard, I can see that you are back, so maybe you can continue your answer from, from before. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I don't know until when you, you heard me, but I think it, 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 it's a bit similar to what Evdokia said. I mean, um, I think there is an, the idea to look more into the future is, is very relevant because uh, we have to also assess you know, future developments if we see look into research. I mean, there are new batteries around which are which consume need less lithium, for example, but which might need other materials. So I think we should make, make our own assessment because it's about Europe's needs and, uh, you know, American needs and Chinese needs might be different. We should, we should look into our industry and, and our goals. So I think the definition, European de definition makes sense because we also have to act on this assessment. So I think it, 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 it is a good one. But I think uh, the idea to be more open, to take more, um, to be more future looking and to 
think a little bit about the definitions we, we have uh, and put until then makes sense. But I think we should not have it also too wide because if we need political action where it is critical and not all over the place, I think we need this focus, which was mentioned in the very uh, beginning also. But I think with regard to copper, for example, that there, there might be in there, there might be a case because it's we can already see now that this is something we uh, we might need. So I think there is some relevance into it, but we should not, you know, go too broad. And uh, I think we can keep it also European our definitions. Thanks. So there's also an intervention by um, Titas, and maybe an, another follow up question for you also. What is actually happening with those raw materials that are not defined critical? Should they also be addressed in in, in some regard, or or do you think um, we should really just focus on? those 30 raw materials that we that we um, been critical uh, so first talking about the differences between the lists obviously we we the economies of china us ours are, are different we're producing different things uh, and tr trade them so since we have different base we have different needs for raw materials uh, so from, from that perspective it doesn't make sense i just echo what others said it doesn't make sense that you know where we have one general list across the globe and uh, having difference is something bad it's not the case it really reflects our needs um so eu is is what we as, as mentioned a bit earlier already we screen uh the actually the widest number of materials in, in eu uh in this Currently, ongoing exercise: 88 materials actually are being screened and and uh, and and sort of discussed with experts and, and looked into all the historical data for for trade and availability and so on, so on, so on. So th that is obviously the widest. Um, so you know why 88? So obviously that's the the, the suspects of where we might have, and we uh, one way or another came up with uh, understanding that. There might be some risks. So obviously, when we talk about uh, you know the policy, as coming back to your second or getting to your second point or question is, uh, do we need to concentrate on critical raw materials or or, or wider? Uh, so the, the the main need is will be on on, on the you know and, and the policy response should be. In, from in my perspective from my point of view it should be on the ones we have really major problems uh, uh, but at the same time uh, i think uh, it's as, as the situation is changing and this critical raw material list is always updated every three three years um, some other things might be applicable to to all uh, raw materials but and especially the ones we we, we consider at, at risk going forward Okay, thanks a lot, Antita. So um, there is an intervention by Mark, who also wants to comment on, on the issue. Yes, very briefly. I think um, Tita's uh, already explained very well. What we need to understand is that the criticality assessment of the European Union, as well as from other regions, is looking into the past. So we are not anticipating what is going to happen in the future. There we have foresight reports that, that help to better understand, but Playing with these terms, critical raw materials, strategic raw materials, um, is, I think, uh, going to play an important role. The other point I would like to mention is that um, there's a need to understand that um, if I take the example of nickel, a nickel producer is not a monometallic producer. So often enough in nickel, we have byproducts like platinum group metals, copper, cobalt, other precious metals, and therefore, I think it is important to also take that into account that measures should not apply on individual metals. We need to understand that there are these metals families um, and that measures should cover the whole family. Okay, thanks a lot. So there is an intervention by um, Hildegard who wants to, to comment on the carbon footprint. Um, so Hildegard, the floor is yours. Yeah, because I think uh, for me, this is a very interesting question because we talk about, you know, producing uh, technologies, producing materials here. But um, if, you, if you're really serious about carbon footprints, that would 
we have, we have not talked about prices, <laughs> which is very interesting also. Um, I mean, my assessment is that we will not have cheap energy in the, in the near future in Europe. And this is one of the main problems, the main factors for producing, process, processing, re refining, as Julia wants, <laughs> which is, is the main obstacle. And this is also one of the main reasons why companies feel more attracted now by the US or other regions where energy is cheaper and continues to be cheaper. So, uh, I mean, I would be really interested, you know, from also Georgia to hear, you know, are European consumers ready to pay this additional price on the products, on the end products, on, on, on e-vehicles, on, on, on uh, windmills and so on, if they can get them much cheaper from, from China. And uh, I mean, we have also other interest uh, instruments like the carbon border adjustment mechanism and so on and so on, because uh, I, I just have, I mean, if you talk about business cases, you know, I'm not yet so sure if this is, if we are already there. I would like to believe it, but what we see currently, those people, I mean, I'm German, uh, which is a pretty rich country, but, uh, you know, to buy currently an e-vehicle is extremely expensive and you have very high primes. And if you want to really electrify our our um, private, uh, private uh, you know, uh, vehicle park, then we need also cheaper cars. <laughs> and, and so, I mean, I, I would be really interested also, Mark, because you mentioned that the carbon footprint, does it really, I mean, uh, if it results in higher prices, are the European consumers ready to pay this? And will this European industry be competitive globally? So I think that's a very clear question, maybe for the industry side more, and um, maybe George, um, Giorgio, you haven't talked in a while. so. Would you like to answer the question, this question? Sure. So thank you for this question. And I think it really shows uh, there's a disconnect between policymaking and what the consumers want. Because the question about the green premium, right? And the willingness of the average consumer to pay that green premium is definitely not a given. There are different stories here depending on what is the actual product you're looking at. And myself, I can obviously comment on batteries and, and the, the products that actually deploy batteries as such. And when it comes to EVs, the, the main aspect here is that EVs are st still seen as a luxury good um if you add to that the range anxiety problem that most consumers still feel then my answer would be no and i don't think it's because of you know the average eu consumer not being concerned with climate change but uh i, I think what's more kind of Pressing is the actual need, right? Uh, and so EVs, uh, the way I see it, and that's my kind of personal understanding of how markets work, uh, is that there's not such a willingness now. And, you know, when it comes to storage, so batteries for storage, it's a completely different question because, of course, it's a B2B business mostly. Of course, you have... Uh, uh prosumer as a trend and this is definitely going to increase and that is also positive moving forward though when it comes to the uh larger kind of plants which are connected to the transmission grid then i think there the role of batteries as a product and the potential green premium that power generators will need to pay um is very different and the attitude i think is uh, mostly kind of positive essentially because the role of batteries as a storage device in the power grid uh, is much better understood and it will continue i think we will definitely uh, have an increase in renewable energies moving forward and batteries uh is probably the most effective and most kind of deployable solution to continue integrating um, increasing volumes of renewable energies into the power grid. 
So that will be my two cents. Thanks a lot. So maybe opening um, the last kind, kind of um, set of questions that I think we also have to address in, in, in this panel is like the question of um, the environment. Um, because the EU um, usually prides itself and have like the high environmental standards. Um, however, there are also like experts saying um, that this is actually not the case. Like for instance, the expert testimony um, to the European Parliament by Stephen Emmerman. Um, Hildegard, what, what, what do you think? Like, is, are we already there when it comes to, to environmental standards? Do we have to do more to ensure that, that and we also live up to the environmental standards? Is that even possible? Or is it like a trade-off between having more minds and autonomy and we living up to the highest um, environmental standards in the world? Well, um, I mean, I, I think we have a really well set um, set of standards. And this is what Mark also said, companies are already working with standards. And I mean, I cannot tell if they are the highest in the world, uh, but they are pretty high. And the problem is we have good standards, but the problem is into implementation. And uh, if you can implement them better, uh, uh, th then we would gain a lot. But what I see currently, also given my German experience, is that, um, for example, with regard to renewables, we had to make also choices, you know, because um, uh, um, you cannot, you have to find a balance. If you want to have projects which are, uh, to a certain extent, invasive to the environment, per se, by their nature, uh, you cannot plant a, a, a factory somewhere without uh, doing some damage to nature. You cannot uh, set a pipeline somewhere or an LNG terminal without doing any harm to nature. So I think we need to balance this because we have different goals. Uh, and I think we should have a good balance there. And we should certainly, uh, it was said many times, we have a geology. Uh, we, we cannot change. So, I mean, we cannot change minds. We cannot change resources from one place to the other. Um, so this is this is the you know discussion we had in the parliament. If we should, for example, ban protected, if we should ban mining from protected areas, uh, and if we have not a tendency to enlarge protected areas all over the place, that means that there is no economic or industrial um, uh, uh, activity possible anymore. And is this what we want? I think we should do it in a responsible way. And I think there are there are good ways out there, and and we should just be more uh, courageous and bold to to tackle them, and also to not uh, have pr procedures which last for for years and years and years. We can do many procedures in parallel. That doesn't mean that we have we do them less diligent or less uh, careful, but we can do them in parallel. And I think we also have to set a an end to discussions. I mean, we should have dialogue, but at the end we have to make a decision. Um, if we want to, you know, uh, keep up our, as it was said, a percentage of domestic mining, then we have to follow up on this. Then we should define the member states, we should define the regions which have to bring this percentage up. And uh, then it's hard to see then uh, uh, to give in to local resistance. If we have a higher strategic goal, I think then we have to, you know, live up to our expectations to our goals we have to balance these goals but to come to a to a good solution at the end thanks a lot so mark hildegard already kind of pointed to the problem of um per the permitting pro process taking really long it's not i think on average it's, it's around eight years at the moment so especially given that we are we have to act really fast now, or the Commission wants to, to act really fast on these, on these issues. How do we speed up this process of permitting? Where do, you, where do you think are the main problems at the moment, and why does it take so long? Difficult to answer. That's the short answer, I would say. Um, I think the most important point is that, that there's a commitment made, you know, that, that we sit together and that there's a commitment made uh, to see what can be done to, on the one side, fasten the processes, while on the other side, ensuring that we um, still protect the environment, that we do things, as Hildegard said, um, diligently. As I think, um, it is not in our interest um, to operate out of any standards. And one point I would like to mention is, um, we have heard right now from, from Hildegard, from Julia, 
the different layers that we are operating under. So on the one side, we are talking here about availability of raw materials. We are talking about sustainability, carbon footprint, costs, energy, regulatory framework. And, and I think that is, that is showing the complexity under which uh, metal producers, raw material producers in, in Europe have to operate. And that makes also clear that in, in the Critical Raw Materials Act, there needs to be some space to talk about this complexity and to see how we can overcome things. Thanks a lot, Mark. So, um, of, I mean, we've already seen like in Portugal, for instance, there's a lot of local resistance to, to a lot of these mining projects, especially to, the, to lithium. So, Julia, maybe a question for you. How should we deal with this local resistance? Should the local communities have more say in the whole process? Or would that even prolong the, the permitting process even longer? What, what is your take on that, Julia? Um, yes, thank you. So, I strongly believe that in Europe, the fastest way to get the Hear me? I, 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 um, I, can you hear me? What? It's okay, we can hear you. Can, you, can hear you. Yes, sorry, so people were saying you cannot hear me. So when it comes to standards, actually, in Europe, we have strong standards around water um, reach, for example, around chemicals and, and habitats, etc. So what is really important for the Critical Raw Materials Act is actually not to um, downgrade and water down those standards. One exception is waste. And that's where we need to reform the extractive waste directive because we are below best practice, even in countries like Ecuador, Peru or China. So fastest way to go is highest standards. Communities will have trust. They are on board and, and, and they will be part of it. And I'd like to finish on, on one comment, if, if I may, around this broader idea of responsibly sourcing raw materials. Critical Raw Materials Act is not a sustainability framework. We all agree and we all understand that. But there is one of the most important frameworks at the moment being discussed by European Parliament, and this is the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive. I am often asked, uh, what standards can Europe put so that we can, via the standards route, uh, have advantage over China? The reality is, uh, be it carbon footprint or recyclability, not much because Chinese companies can do similar things. Where we do still have an edge is in this human rights due diligence, transparency, traceability, the social angle of, of more responsible supply chains. So it's really worrying that European companies, given that they have advantage, do not want to accept higher standards around disclosure, which would allow them actually to pivot and, and, and be you know, on top of, for example, Chinese supplies. So if we want responsible standards, let's support uh, CSDDD and leave critical metals to ensure European self-sufficiency. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Julia. So, of course, I would love to keep the discussion running, but unfortunately, we have already run out of time. So, at this point, it would be like to thank you all for this really lively debate, I think. And um, I think we've touched some really important questions here tonight. So, thank you all for being here and um, see you soon, hopefully. Thanks. <laughs>